Hello, and welcome to another Light Reading Podcast. My name is Phil Harvey. I'm an editor here at Light Reading. I'm Kelsey Sizer, and I'm also an editor at Light Reading. Hello, Kelsey. Hello, Phil. <laughs> Good to see you again. And uh, we got to reminisce a little bit in this podcast about uh, that, that one time we were in the same city at the same time. It was magical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we went to Raleigh uh, for the Smart Cities Conference back in May. Um, why are we talking about that now? Because our guest is Chelsea Collier, and she is the um, she was one of the, uh, uh, I would say, the editorial directors for that conference uh, mm-hmm. because she helped, um, you know, direct, uh, come up with a lot of the panels and and drive a lot of the discussions that were happening in a Smart Cities conference. Uh, conference. And also she's the uh, founder and uh, uh, I would say president of DigiCity, which is a nonprofit that started as kind of a mission-driven media company that was sort of dedicated toward um, pointing out the best uh, sort of examples of where um, city leaders are um, using connectivity and data collection to help their citizens and you know mm-hmm. make their, their cities more livable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we talked to her a little bit about um, data collection and, and analytics and how, um, you know, cities can go about improving their approach to that and what some of uh, the challenges are. She mentioned that a lot of times it takes a champion of um, uh, of that to mm-hmm. to move things forward and that a lot of cities honestly aren't really doing such a great job at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems like there's, there's more... Um kind of instances where um, data collection and how it's used is very siloed. And we get into some specifics on that. And then we talked a bit about, you know, the upside of using AI in cities. And if you're part of our, you know, normal light reading audience, um, this should excite you because we're not only talking about an environment where there's sort of a, um, a massive amount of data and devices that need constant connectivity, but we're talking about opportunities that's that sort of spin off of using that data. So there's definitely some commercial opportunities that are, that are, I would say very close, closely related to making cities more livable by improving how they use data. And, Mm -hmm. and, and, and it all starts with connectivity, and we of course get into that as well because we talk about digital in, uh, inequality, and you know get her views on on uh, how we could be doing a better job of uh, you know not only connecting cities but also making sure that there aren't any um, you know what was the term spatial inequality as well mm-hmm. you know there, there there are places where there's enough resources you know um, equally distributed in the city. Yeah. And um, she also gave some interesting examples of how AI is already being used. She talked a little bit about um, applications around water infrastructure. Um, but I think with that, we'll um, go ahead and get into that interview and hear directly from Chelsea. And welcome to the podcast, Chelsea Collier, the uh, founder of DigiCity. Thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah. Very happy to be here. Nice to connect with y'all. Yeah. Good to connect with you as well. And also good to see you back uh, in May. We uh, met briefly at Raleigh, uh, in, in Raleigh with for the uh, Smart Cities Connect uh, conference, uh, yeah. a conference series that Light Reading is very fond of. Gives us yeah. a chance to uh, talk to all the technical folks in all the various cities and towns that uh, we, uh, how should I put this? Uh, we aren't visiting on a regular enough basis, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and that's kind of the whole purpose of Smart Cities Connect is to bring everyone under one roof. And being in Raleigh was really great. The city was an awesome host in surrounding communities like Cary. So yeah. it was a lot of yeah, fun. It was, yeah, it was, it was a great turnout um, locally. And I, yeah, I met a ton of, uh, of folks uh, locally. And also, um, yeah, the place just, the uh, hospitality couldn't have been better in terms yeah. of you know, how to go into a conference and things just being easy from, you know, from the time you arrive. So I was, I was very happy about that. Yeah. Um, so Chelsea, tell us about, um, uh, DigiCity because, um, it's, it's a, a recent nonprofit before that it had kind of become, it was, it was sort of your, um, uh, 
your blog or your, your outlet, mm -hmm. I guess, kind of, yeah. so it's almost kind of gone from being a publication to being an institution. Could tell me about <laughs> how that happened. Yeah, it's exactly right. Well, I started off with no end in mind. I just thought, you know, back in 2016, while I was learning what a smart city was and what it wasn't and what people thought about it and why should we care? Um, as I was learning about this, I thought other people might want to learn about it too. So I started writing a blog and that really resulted from a fellowship I did, the Eisenhower Fellowship, which was really exciting. They, they look at folks all over the globe and kind of look at how we can learn from each other and, and create the world as a better place as it would be. So um, I focused on smart cities in the U.S. and China. And yeah, DigiCity was my way of sharing what I was learning as I went. Excellent. And how, how, did, um, how did that evolve into becoming a, a nonprofit and, yeah. and sort of, you know, I, I would, and are you is that a single person effort at this moment or is it is it expanding into something bigger? Yeah, it evolved one step at a time. And the question of, you know, once people started reading it and talking about it, and I really used it as a platform to showcase people who I thought were doing a really interesting job of implementing thought smart cities thoughtfully and with the social impact lens. Um, I just wanted to feature them because I was learning so much about them. Again, I thought other people might want to, too. So as pe other people started reading it and sharing, I thought, "Ooh, wow, this is a thing. Should it be a consultancy? Should it be a media site? Should it be a research effort? And then it all just kind of became came that all at once. Um, and then fast forward, I guess, eight years, um, I thought, well, you know, there might be an opportunity to support people in doing grants and DigiCity might be an opportunity to kind of act as that nexus. So um, that's the capacity that it's operating in right now. And I'm doing a lot of research with the university, the University of Texas at Austin around resident engagement and smart cities and the ethical use of AI. And so who knows, maybe that that will be kind of the extension of <laughs> where DigiCity goes. It's kind of to be determined. And yeah. I like the organic nature. It makes me feel like I'm serving the needs as they arise as opposed to having an end in mind. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I might, cause my next question was kind of going to be around what the, uh, you know, non with your nonprofit hat on what the agenda items were or whether, whether you were kind of measuring your progress at this stage. And cause I know it's only been a nonprofit for like a year or so, mm -hmm. but like, are you measuring that in terms of like engagements or projects or, you know, sort of what's that, or is it just kind of, we'll see when we get there, you know, let's, let's just keep, let's just keep yeah. talking and connecting with people. Very much the latter. We'll see when we get there. And, you know, quarterly, I would have this conversation with myself. And by the way, Digital City is me, myself, and I you know, kind of do what you do best and link to the rest. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I get to be very nimble and move as fast as I need to go or as slow as I need to go. And that has always felt like the right approach. It just allows me to be more responsive to what's happening. And, you know, the field of smart cities is moving so quickly, even though government isn't always <laughs> thought of as moving quickly, the whole sector is is just yeah. transforming rather rather rapidly, but in a very thoughtful way. So I'm happy to see that. Yeah, what, um, I'll uh, pause. Kelsey looked like she was about if if uh, if I keep following my tendency, I just keep interrupting everybody. So I'm I, I'm mindfully shutting my mouth for a second. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Me next, Phil. Uh, <laughs> can you, so, so I was looking over um, DigiCity's uh, website and there are some conversations on there about digital equity. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how Digi uh, DigiCity is working on um, digital equity and, and what you see some of the challenges are there? Yeah, it's a really important question. And I'm very happy to see that that's becoming more of a forefront issue as opposed to, a, oh, by the way, we also need to think about digital equity <laughs> issue. Um, I use DigiCity not as kind of a, a way to implement that directly, but to showcase what other leaders are doing in that space. Um, I think one of the people who have who has done some really impressive work is Jen Sanders out of the North Texas Innovation Alliance and then with, with the Dallas Innovation Alliance. 
And she's, you know, again, very organically and one step at a time, use this collaborative, cooperative method of bringing all sorts of different stakeholders, whether it's local government or the transportation authority, private sector partners who are aligned and who support the the social equity piece of smart cities and specifically um, digital equity. And then they learn from experts, you know, who are leading in that space as well and connect with NDIA and, you know, all of the federal groups that are working so carefully in that space too. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with uh, Miss Sanders' work over at the uh, North. Te- yeah, why? What is that organization again? North Texas Innovation North Alliance. Texas Innovation Alliance. Yeah, NTXIA. It changed <laughs> from something else earlier, and I don't remember what it was called before. Yeah. But I like that that it says North Texas because a, a lot of folks who don't live up here in the Dallas Fort Worth and all the cities in between have yeah. no idea, you know, how sprawling it is. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's something like 9,000 square miles. I mean, it's a massive, you know, chunk of land, yeah. 13 or 14 counties. That's crazy. Know, lots of cities in between. I'm going to say north of 8 million people, but I might be wrong on that. But I think it's somewhere in that, in that ballpark and just spread yeah. out over a gargantuan, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, area. And so, you know, not only are there um, a wide variety of opinions on how to do different things and cities running and, you, you know, within, within that you know, giant, massive land, there's cities that are run completely different than their neighbors. Mm-hmm. And so trying to um, find common ground between those cities and also implement things that are going to, you know, we also ha- are like, I guess, everywhere now we're staring down, you know, kind of an energy crisis and stuff yeah. like that. You know, we've been off the grid a couple of times in the last few years, you know, yep. that was painful. I live in yeah. Texas too. So yeah. yeah, exactly. And so it's like, you know, we're, we're, uh, sort, sort of these issues are not ones that are where we're talking about something scary in the future. It's something scary happening now. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy when uh, uh, there are institutions set up to help cities kind of cooperate and mm-hmm. share ideas, because I do think they're going to have to take the data, any data they can get their hands on about, um, you know, how to, how to improve the lives of their citizens and, and, you know, uh, save resources and stuff like that. They're going to have to pull their resources, uh, very quickly mm-hmm. and learn from each other probably faster than they have yeah. in the past. Uh, maybe, um, you know, so I, it, it does seem, you know, I, I'm, uh, thanks for bringing, uh, North Texas up. Cause I definitely need to, uh, reconnect with them and find out, you know, yeah. what they're, what they're working on lately. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask, you know, speaking of data collection and that sort of thing, um, kind of one of the, well, the, the last smart cities conference talked a lot about AI and people's concerns about AI and where it was going and that sort of thing. But one of the things I've always liked about, um, or one of the original reason, um, things that stuck out to me, the, one of the earliest things I read on Digi, DigiCity, the blog, um, back in the day back was the day. <laughs> how you defined a smart city. Like what is a smart city? Yeah. And it just seemed like a, um, a very, a succinct way of saying, you know, any city where the government is involved in using connectivity, sensors, and data for the benefit of its citizens, you right. know, and 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 so that that also crystallized in a moment, you know, why you know our readership cares about it so much, you know, even even if it's not a major market for them. It's like they're supplying the connectivity, they're, you know, maintaining the sensors, they're running the cellular networks and stuff yeah. like that, that all that stuff pings against and all that data is collected from. And I wanted to kind of in your, um, you know, experience and all this uh, city leaders you've talked to, how would, how advanced would you say are most cities in, in the U.S. when it comes to things like utilizing the data they've collected and applying some kind of analytics to it. Yeah. What I've learned is that very few cities take a comprehensive approach to data governance, to data collection, and and the thoughtful use of data. Most of the time, it's a champion within a specific department. So you may have, um, you know, someone in, uh, you know, if it's a municipally owned utility being very thoughtful about power usage and how to inform residents and citizens about what data they use and and how that can be um, 
mitigated or the effect that it has on the grid in real time. And there's a communication philosophy behind all of that. Um, but one city in particular, another Texas city. So I know we're, we're over indexing on Texas, but no, we're not. <laughs> not <my point> <laughs> yeah. um, San Antonio has actually done, I think, the best, if not one of the best jobs um, of, of really thoughtfully looking at a holistic data governance platform. They were one of the first cities in the U.S. to do interlocal data sharing agreements amongst all of their different departments internally with the city of San Antonio, with the Transportation Authority, um, even with a county government and with a state agency. And then, you know, it took them, I think, a year and a half just to make sure that the lawyers were happy with how they were talking to each other. Um, you know, we always like to talk about technology and ones and zeros, but under Underneath all of that is just, do people trust each other? Do they understand each other? Is there a common kind of motivation or incentive? You know, it's, it's all these human things that make things uh, kind of gum up. So they did a very thoughtful and deliberate job of making that happen. Um, and they published a bit about it on their, on, their, on their site. So they're always the example that I point to just because I know how thoughtful they were about it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, that that's one of the sort of things that came to mind as I was hearing all of the thoughts and concerns about how cities may or may not use AI. I was sort of thinking back and going like, well, how many of them are actually like soup to nuts, actually collecting and using data? And like yeah. you were saying, I, I, you put it so well, because that's what I've heard too, is it's, it's all kind of come down to a project by project basis. Yeah. And like maybe, you know, the water department is doing some really kick-ass thing and they're- yeah you know, completely switched on and they, whatever, but they're not talking to transportation and they're not talking to whoever. And they're a great case study and use case all by themselves, yeah. but, but that's not going anywhere, you know, yeah. and, and, and then other, you know, so we're not even sure what other departments could do with that. And to know that that's the reality. And then everybody's like, yeah, and we're going to use AI. I'm like, right. <laughs> Yeah. You know, no. It's easy to get really freaked out about AI and yeah. you know, not for good reason. We need to be concerned. We need to be talking about it. You know, folks like Joy Bulanwini and Dr. Uh, Ruha Benjamin, they've done some really important groundbreaking work around, you know, the unintended or sometimes intended ethical consequences around AI and that we need to be very thoughtful about all of that, of course. But a lot of the time, how AI is being used in cities has been happening for many, many years. And it's the big, boring, beautiful projects that I really love, like sensors on aging water infrastructure and, you know, all of these um, kind of literally below the ground municipal operational uh, projects or, or thoughts that you know, it's it's not a camera collecting personally identifiable data. That's what we should be concerned about. But I think to your point, doing an inventory and making it okay to talk about, hey, how's here? Here's how we're using AI. What can we learn from each other? And that's where I see most of the conversation and a lot of the effort in municipalities going is just education internally within the city about, hey, who's using AI? How has it been used in the past? Is there any way that we could support each other in that? What do we need to learn? What cautions do we need to have? And how can we educate our residents and our communities about what we're doing, how we're doing it, and then invite them into the conversation? That's, I think, kind of the next stage. And it's the reason why Believe it or not, I'm actually really excited about this time in AI because it is it is a mirror. It it shows us what we are doing, literally how we are treating each other, how we are thinking about each other, and where we need to make some serious course corrections and the opportunity to just involve everyone and have their voice heard. Is is um uh to kind of delve back into the big, boring, beautiful projects yeah. uh, thing. Because AI, I think, is going to be most useful there. Maybe first is yeah. is that one of the areas where you see it being most impactful in the next, you know, kind of short term? Uh, is is like, uh, or there specific uh, case studies that are kind of evolving in 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 that 
area. And then alongside that, how do you see the connectivity providers, you know, um, either helping here or, Mm -hmm. you know, do they just, are they just sort of standing on the sideline with their arms folded at the moment? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm I'm kind of trying to figure out how engaged service providers really are in the process of, uh, you know, evolving cities. Yeah, it's a good question in terms of the big, beautiful, boring projects. <laughs> um, I learned a lot, actually, from the CIO for the city of Raleigh, um, Mark Wittenberg, who talked about how they were looking at AI and their approach. And he was telling me about a water infrastructure project where you know they were identifying lead pipes and looking at reams and reams of, of um, kind of structural drawings that would take a human being many, many months to go through and say, hey, here's where I think we need to update these lead pipes. And, you know, AI was more effective at doing that quickly. So, you know, I think any time that you can analyze massive amounts of really boring static data, that is a wonderful use case for AI. Where you have to be careful is when you're talking about human beings and maybe on purpose or not on purpose, not really thinking through who you're talking about, the data that AI is being trained upon, and then some of the unintended consequences of, of those actions. Yeah, that's that's a great great way to put it. I think uh, um, if I can lobby for anything at the moment with no money involved, of course, because I'm yeah. a uh, <laughs> free lobbyist. Hey, first uh, time ever. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll buy somebody a six pack somewhere, but, but the, <laughs> the whole thing of of uh, timing our street lights. I mean, yeah. our traffic lights, come on people like just, just drive around North Texas with me and let me show you how patently absurd we, we, we are in our cars and how right. I'm 15 minutes at one intersection with no one in it. And I'm 13 seconds to cross, you know, Skillman and I 35 or something. Right. You know, where it's like, you know, where, where it's like, uh, you know, you're in downtown Beirut, you know, in rush hour and you're just like, you know, running at 55 miles an hour just to get across the, you know, the eight lane, uh, you know, turn. It it just doesn't seem, it's not that it does. It's, it's like, I'm sure it was all timer based or it had some, you know, weight switch or some kind of, uh, clever thing from, uh, you know, 50 years ago, Yeah, man, we need to really address that. That is, I, I think that's a, um, uh, an issue that would just cause a lot of people, uh, uh, or would alleviate a lot, a lot of highway stress, which might, uh, you know, which might help the whole city. Yeah. It would help me personally. That's for sure. And (laughs) I mean, it's such a a great example of how we experience our city is Mm -hmm. inherently and uniquely individual, but how those city systems interact with me, myself, and I as a human being are complex and sometimes disconnected. And so the idea of, well, it should be easy to just time streetlights. You know, I'm sitting at the, at the stoplight being like, oh my God, why is this so hard? I know a lot about smart cities and this just should be easier. Yeah. But then I dive into it and I understand that some of those streetlights are owned by the municipalities. Some of them are not. They're all in different legacy systems. Right. This part has been upgraded, but this hasn't. This has a LIDAR, but this has a license plate reader. How do we feel about license plate readers? I have my own personal opinion, but yeah. And then you just get into this quagmire of city Mm -hmm. system and service delivery and but at the end of the day, what are we going to do with the data and then all yeah. that stuff? And how do we adjust it? And yeah. Yeah. And, I, and it's like an all, and all the while, you know, we're looking at it from a consumer point of view and just going, right. yeah, but also your, you know, Verizon's and companies like that are bragging about how cool their 5G network is and how you can connect everything to everything and you can process the data in five seconds or whatever. And, and so it's just like, okay, well, somebody, somebody figure this out. Cause it's, it's just, it's just, it's like the rest we're, we're sitting here suffering traffic light by traffic light. And it seems like we have all the tools in place to fix this, you know, yeah. cause how many other places in the world don't have absolutely killer broadband infrastructure you know, that, that reaches most of the population most of the time. Yeah. And that's, it's like, yeah, doing, um, uh, you know, I don't know, applying some artificial intelligence to that problem 
of mm-hmm. just traffic flow to me would be a miracle. You know, Agreed. I would love to see what AI could come up with when it looks at how we're moving now yeah. and whether it makes sense to, I don't know, reroute things a bit or change yeah. the timing of some things or, or whatever. Or at the very least, understand why that is not happening or why that will happen at some time, at some yeah. known certain date, but it's not happening today. It's that feed loop back loop yeah. that's missing in modern municipal government. And I think that's the great, great, great opportunity for smart cities and AI. And again, the conversation around, ooh, it's so scary and more Americans are concerned about AI than excited about it, you know, according to Pew, uh, asterisk in, in reference there. Well. Um, but at the same time, it also offers a, an opportunity to, to have the conversation that we haven't been able to have before. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping yeah. that's where it goes if we all kind of lean in and, and force it to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very hopeful that someday we'll have the, um, uh, the, what is it? The, the, the line meter equivalent thing, you know, on traffic lights and on, um, uh, in, in, in our, in our apps, that's kind of fed like more accurate data that's fed back from yeah. the city infrastructure that says, um, you know, without a doubt, this distance to this distance is going to take that's- you this amount of time. Right. No, no questions asked yeah. because that just helps you, you know, organize your day, plan your route, you right. know, maybe stay home for a little longer, maybe leave a little earlier, do whatever. And I, I think, I think that's also kind of a thing of getting by in cities is, is just lowering the day-to-day frustration, Lately. Um, you know, in terms of dealing with not only city governments, but also just, yeah. you know, interacting with, with local businesses and stuff like that. Yeah. And a lot of that, unfortunately in Texas involves cars. So yeah. For sure. Well, and subconsciously, I think it also communicates something to our reptilian brain, which is, oh, cool. The city's doing something interesting. Oh, wow. They communicated with me in this way. And now my day is easier. That does a lot. Again, I think subconsciously to reinforce our trust in government Mm-hmm. And that is a bit of a gap. I mean, not to totally derail our conversation and be a total De- Debbie Downer about it, but you know, I think we need all the positive interactions we can get. And yeah. you know, we're all fortunate enough to know a lot of the city leaders who just dedicate their careers to public service. Mm-hmm. How hard they try, and how thoughtful they are, and how dedicated they are. And then you see the quagmire that is some of these city systems, and you're like. Oh my God. And so it's the tension between those two things. I mean, you asked the question and I just kind of came up with the answer about Digicity. Why did you create it? It was like, yeah. because I know some things about the people who are trying to make it better. Like it's not all terrible. Mm-hmm. It's actually quite wonderful. And I want to tell those stories and, and share what they're doing. So. Yeah. And, for, and with that, uh, we'll definitely steer people to, you know, some of those uh, on, on her web, uh, on uh, the Digicity website, there's uh, case studies and examples. Cause like you said, you, you tend to link to the, and, and sort of tell the stories of the places that are, um, uh, doing a good job or have taken an innovative approach to some of these, uh, you know, issues we're outlining. Yeah. Um, Kelsey, and everything's I'm, free. I don't track eyeballs. I don't sell data. Right. <laughs> for the good of the people. <laughs> no, yeah, you're not one of those evil uh, media companies. Like, oh, that. not that there's anything wrong with that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, you, I, actually, we'll it's, 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 <laughs> yeah. I was about to say no. We're uh, we're we're in the uh, 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 kind of the lowercase media business because we're sort of uh, sort of watching, but but we're not really sure what we're watching. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that. that is one thing I like about uh, this podcast though, is that, um, that different than an article, an article people will find, will write you and be very formal about their approach or yeah. whatever, for whatever reason on the podcast, they feel like they have ownership. And so first yeah. let me just comment on how much I hate your shirt and then <laughs> into whatever you're talking about. And I just think that's the best interaction because it's like, you know, they actually heard you and listened, <laughs> whatever, you know. So. Totally. Both of your shirts are great, by the I way. I really don't oh, like thanks. the shirts. No, it's, uh, it's a thing. I'm going to keep, really keep good. I did do collar today, but I didn't iron it. Nice. So. Oh, yeah. Fancy. I'm, yeah. So I it's a little disappointing, but a little better. So Ironing <laughs> is so 2019. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last um, question for with Kelsey and then and then we'll have to wrap up. 
Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think um, just looping back to our earlier conversation about digital equity, I was also looking at the site and there were some conversations around um, spatial inequity. Is there a Venn diagram at all there between spatial yeah. inequity and, um, you know, improving digital equity? It, or am I making links where there aren't any? <laughs> I mean, you are making the appropriate links. And one of the problems is that there aren't more links where they should be. So, you know, spatial inequities in cities is one of the things that's motivating me. I decided to go back to school. So I'm pursuing my PhD at UT Austin, focused on ethical AI, looking at resident engagement and spatial inequities, and really just trying to bridge that gap between how cities have historically been created and implemented um, with just in absolutely embarrassing spatial inequities and all based on historical racism and uh, lots of socioeconomic issues that are now becoming very much in our digital lives. So we see that, of course, related to transportation, related to access to basic human needs like food and water. <laughs> and now in the digital age, that's connected, of course, to, to broadband. And I'm definitely not the, the first person to say this, but you know, the global pandemic was that mirror right in our face that this is not acceptable. It is should not have been acceptable. And we absolutely have to prioritize how to not just take care of some residents, but all residents. And where that gap is, is a reflection on who we are in our communities. So I think, um, again, that AI can be applied to really showcase where those gaps are. And I'll give a shout out to State of Place. This is my friend, my brilliant friend, um, Dr. Mariela Afonso. And she's looking at basically mapping different digital environments and then showcasing those inequities in the built environment. So a lot of her early research was on walkability score, but then she can apply that to how resources are kind of um, spaced or not spaced within cities and what that means and what cities can do about it. You know, there are very real things that you can do from physical to digital infrastructure to bridge that gap. And then it just becomes about having the will to do it mm -hmm. and the budget. But thankfully, yeah. <laughs> there is there is still some budget available on, from federal resources and grants. Yeah, I think that is something that occasionally, I mean, we talked about, um, you know, traveling to different cities for mm -hmm. a Smart Cities Connect, for example. Yeah. And, um, and sometimes when I'm uh, traveling for work, it does seem more apparent when I'm trying to walk between my hotel and a convention yeah. center, if there's a food desert, or um, maybe this isn't the best maybe I shouldn't be walking here. I should, um, or it looked fine on the map, but really there's an interstate right here and I should take an Uber, but it's yeah. only, you know, yeah, where there's, where it's just <laughs> if I could walk it, it'd be 10 minutes. And yeah. it's, it's yeah. kind of interesting when you've, you, um, are on the ground in that way. And it's, it's much more apparent than when you're in your own city and you've got a car and yep. just kind of, yeah. yeah. So. And we shouldn't normalize that. I mean, I think as Americans, um, specifically as Texans, we're so used to our cities being only drivable and it isn't that walkable. And there's lots of different um, uh, kind of urban scholars who, who are studying this and trying to bridge that and paying a lot of attention to that. Um, but at the same time, it's just about saying this is not acceptable. And here are the steps that we can take to to make that different. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And it rubs off on, you know, companies that are like looking to invest in areas and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, when there's like, um, uh, longs, you know, blocks and blocks of, of unwalkable, you know, yeah. landscape yeah. At, with, you know, coupled with the fact that there's like a, you know, like you were saying, uh, Kelsey, uh, like a food desert or just mm -hmm. sort of, you know, like a poorly resourced, you know, chunk of uh several blocks they're just not going to actively invest in that because yeah. there there's sort of nothing to get going and so it it scares off potential commerce yeah. um makes the citizens avoid it gives the people who are visiting a really rough idea of what the wrong idea of what your city's all about yeah it's just bad all the way around so it definitely i could see how there how it um how there could be definitely a venn diagram that sort of shows uh, 
how broadband connectivity in those areas is also mm -hmm. uh, probably poorer than average and definitely needs to be improved. There's relationships between all of those. And one of the um, research groups that I really love is called the City Science Lab out of Hamburg in, in Germany. And I had the great opportunity to escape the Texas heat last year <laughs> and spend um, the summer in Hamburg and really learn about their approaches. And they basically digitally map cities and then we'll use different emerging technologies like augmented reality and virtual reality and you can walk around and understand exactly what it feels like to walk from this city block to that city block um, and you can do it in one space so i thought about this in terms of informing elected officials in term and in informing grant makers about yeah, this is how this looks in a PDF, but this is how it feels. And yeah. this doesn't feel good. And this doesn't feel safe. And this doesn't feel like your city really cares that you're there. And I know that we can do better. So I'm looking at all those kinds of different emerging technologies, which require massive amounts of bandwidth, of course, and lots of open data um, and AI to make those connections and just make the case clearer and easier to understand about the current reality in our municipalities and the steps to address those. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, we will leave it there for now. And uh, we will talk to you uh, at the next Smart Cities event, if not sooner. Yeah. Uh, Chelsea Collier, thanks so much for being on the Light Reading Podcast. Thanks for the opportunity. I always love to visit with y'all.